Good morning, uh, everybody. Happy 4th of July, and good morning to you uh, folks that are watching from uh, home this morning. We're going to start off the service with just singing the first verse, and I'm pretty sure everybody knows about Heart the Star Spangled Banner. We have the American flag this morning. If everybody would stand, uh, we will be singing this a cappella. Let's get uh, Brother David. He'll give us the starting note, and y'all sing out loud and proud this morning. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars Heavenly Father, the first thing we thank you for is being the loving God that you are. Yes. The way you watch over us, protect us, and guide us. Lord, I just pray that each and every one of us here, and those of, uh, of us that are at home uh, watching this service, would just clear our hearts and clear our minds of all things except for focusing upon you. Yeah. May your word feed us. May your word make us strong. And may we just be the examples that we need to be, not only to our families, but to everybody we come in contact with. We thank you for the day that we are celebrating. Lord, we thank you for the way you have blessed our nation, our leaders. And Lord, we pray for all of our government leaders now, Lord. We just pray that you would give them the wisdom that they need, Lord, to make decisions that are so important to the future of this country. And Lord, we just pray that you will, again, guide us in the direction that we need to go, Lord, to stay close to you and also to do the things that need to be done properly while we're here on this earth. Be with Pastor this morning. Give him the words that you want him to have to bring to us to help us make become better servants. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Uh, we're going to sing, turn over to 438. I do like last week as long as you sing out, all right? I'll let y'all be seated. It's a long time to stand. And some people are wearing their masks the whole time as well, so uh, I'll give you a little break there. Uh, very quickly, I went to, and I already talked to Linda. I apologize for not mentioning the Ayers family last week. Um, Tony's grandmother went home to be with the Lord, and we're rejoicing with the fact that we know where she is. Amen. Uh, she is perfect today. Amen. And, um, I want y'all to continue to pray for the Ayers family, and in particular, Linda, I was sharing with her this morning that my mother took care of her mother, my grandmother, for probably six years in their home. And when you're a caretaker and you take care of a family member like that, when they're not there anymore, there is, and Linda, she agreed, there's a void there. You're not taking care of that precious one anymore. And so I would like y'all to really pray for Linda in the coming days ahead. That the Lord be so very real to her and comfort her in this in this time, but at the same time that uh, He would uh, cheer her, cheer her heart, and in, in, in the fact that she knows where uh, Tony's grandmother is today. The other thing is, uh, 
oh, two, it's not been two weeks, uh, almost two weeks ago, when I attended uh, Victor Mullen's funeral. Uh, the pastor of, of Howells was really close with uh, Brother Victor, and he shared a lot about Victor's character. Victor was the type of guy, wherever he was, whether it was family, friends, or, uh, or somebody didn't really know, he always took the opportunity to be a witness and to be a help in whatever way he could. He was a giving person, give up his time and his talents. And, and I thought of that because the Lord gave uh, Tammy and the girls an opportunity to, to give a little bit of their talents to, to Tony's grandmother. Uh, there were a couple times where they came over and they sang. They sang to her, especially her latter days. And that meant the world to her. It really did. You know, we, we don't realize, given a little bit of our time and talent, what an impact it makes on others. And uh, at the same time, I don't say this because they're part of my family, but God is pleased with that yeah, right. when we give of our time and our talents. You know, a lot of people feel like if they just give their money, they've done their part. No, no. I believe the time and the talents is much more important than, than the monetary part of it. So I just want to encourage y'all, you know, that funeral really opened my eyes. I, there's so much more that we could do as believers. We can give more. I hope that none of us ever get to the point where we feel like we're doing enough. Even the Apostle Paul, as great as he was, they admitted that uh, the things that he should be doing, he didn't do, and the things that he didn't want to do, he did do. And so, you know, because we still have that, that sin nature, that fleshly nature, the flesh doesn't want to give and doesn't want to serve. But that new nature does. And, and the way we keep that strong is to have that personal relationship with the Lord that we need to have and be in his word constantly to strengthen us spiritually. So didn't mean to give a little sermon there. But I think Pastor has a card he will share from the uh, uh, family this morning when he gets up here. All right, uh, my country tis thee. We'll do all four verses. This one. I didn't do it this morning. I've been given the page number. Nobody has a hymn or something. I don't work out too well. But it's up on the screen here this morning. Uh, 
I, I, I prayed for my country yesterday and uh, very concerned about what I see in, in our nation today. So we need to pray and pray fervently. Um, hey, before I go any further, though, too, I just, uh, Brother Jim's opened us in prayer, but it's so good to see Jim and Mary Barley up from Houston, Texas. And they'll be up here for a few weeks, I think, till the end of October. But, man, it's great to see them. Uh, Long-time members here at Calvary Baptist Church until they moved to Houston. Uh, what's that been, about three or four years? Four years, wow. And, uh, but anyway, they're back with us here today. We're excited about that. Feels like old times. Um, very quickly, just one announcement. These upcoming elections, as all of them are, are extremely important. Um, I guess it's easy to say something like this, but I, I, I honestly believe at this time, I think this next presidential election may be the most important one in my lifetime because if, they, if things don't go the right way, uh, you might just lose this country altogether. Do you think I'm being overly dramatic? I don't think so. I really don't think so. And uh, it's going to take it's going to take a strong, strong leadership in the White House, and uh, and we really need to be praying for our political leaders today. We need to pray that many of them would be converted to Christ. We need to pray that God would impart wisdom, because Washington D.C. Uh, for the most part, is absolutely devoid of godly wisdom, and we're paying the price for it. So make sure you vote, and we, we make sure to vote, and we want to help uh, that that help you in that process. Don't be ashamed if there's someone here today that uh, has not registered to vote. Um, You'll be able to do so. Uh, Ashley and Joey will help you with this. We're working in conjunction with a God and Country organization. And uh, they'll be equipped to help you with that as you exit after the service, uh, as you go through this side door. As I read to you last week, the statistics, I mean, they're basically of all the evangelical Christians that profess the name of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, I don't think it's even half of them uh, from what Barna Research has told us that, that goes to the poll to vote. And that's part of the reason we're in the problem that we're in today. So I encourage you to register if you haven't already. Everybody in this building needs to vote when the next elections come. We need to vote the right people into office. And uh, those that are closest to the Word of God and the values of the Word of God. So. All right, well, uh, with that, I'm going to retake my seat and continue with the service. God bless you. Good to see you.
On the, eve of our... on the eve of our struggle for independence, a man who might have been one of the greatest among the founding fathers, Dr. Joseph Warren, president of the Massachusetts Congress, said to his fellow Americans, our country is in danger, but not to be despaired of. On you depend the fortunes of America. You are to decide the important question which, upon which rests the happiness and the liberty of millions yet unborn. Act worthy of yourselves. Well, I believe we, the Americans of today, are ready to act worthy of ourselves. Ready to do what must be done to ensure happiness and liberty for ourselves, our children, and our children's children. From time to time, we've been tempted to believe that society has become too complex to be managed by self-rule, that government by an elite group is superior to government for, by, and of the people. We are a nation that has a government, not the other way around. And this makes us special among the nations of the earth. Our government has no power except that granted it by the people. It is made up of men and women who raise our food, patrol our streets, man our mines and factories, teach our children, keep our homes, and heal us when we're sick. Professionals, industrialists, shopkeepers, clerks, cabbies, and truck drivers. They are, in short, we the people. Their patriotism is quiet but deep. Their values sustain our national life. With the idealism and fair play which are the core of our system and our strength, we can have a strong and prosperous America at peace with itself and the world. So with all the creative energy at our command, let us begin an era of national renewal. Let us renew our determination, our courage, and our strength. And let us renew our faith and our hope. It is time for us to realize that we are too great a nation to limit ourselves to small dreams. We will again be the exemplar of freedom and a beacon of hope for those who do not now have freedom. We are a nation under God, and I believe God intended for us to be free. This time we'd like to have a word of prayer for our nation. So if you would please join in, in with me. Um, we thought about bringing folks uh, up front to pray, but uh, we'll maintain our social distancing here this morning. But we really need to, to pray with a burden and uh, with an attitude that is unrelenting, we need to pursue God for the sake of our country, ladies and gentlemen. Dear Father, we come humbly before thee today. We have no strength within ourselves to make the corrections that are needed in this nation. And what is needed, Father, is a change of heart. And Lord, you, you're the only one that can make that happen. And so Lord, today, with what strength we have, we turn to thee and seek thy face. We have been reminded in thy word that if your people would just uh, call upon you and humble themselves and seek your face and turn from their wicked ways, then you would hear from heaven and would forgive their sin and heal their land. Father, we need forgiveness and we need healing. So Lord, I pray that thou wouldst rise up in the midst of thy people and show thyself mighty today. I pray that beginning today, you would begin to turn the hearts 
of the politicians and the leaders of this nation. I pray that there would be pockets of revival that would begin to break out all across America. And Lord, we pray this for one shining purpose, and that is that you would be in all things glorified by this country. So Lord, we commit our nation to thee. And Father, we pray that thou wouldst intervene with thy mighty hand before it's too late. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Before I get to the message this morning, I'd like to just share with you a card uh, from, from the heirs. And um, <clears throat> whoever's uh, on the PA system, if you could just turn my microphone down a little bit. Uh, if you hear me back, somebody in the foyer, I need some assistance on the, on the PA system. Just turn me down. I'm a little bit loud, I'm afraid. Um, let me read to you what the card says and then what the heirs have written. It says, to all of you, somehow, just saying thank you doesn't seem like enough. But I hope you know how much your kindness has meant to us. And as Brother Gary said, this is written in light of the recent homegoing of uh, Tony's grandmother, Lillian Ayers. And... Um, they write within the card, first of all, the text found in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. It's a great one. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. Dear church family, we deeply appreciate your expression of support and love with the passing of our grandmother. Your meals, cards, calls, and especially your prayers gave us so much comfort. Thank you, uh, Tony, Tony and Linda Ayers. Thank you, church family, for your prayers. I hope you will continue to pray uh, for God's strength and blessing upon the family there. I just want to share with you briefly this morning, I, I, I think what I would like to express to you is more in the form of a devotional than it is a sermon per se, at least that's the way I view it. You know, this holiday is about so much more than hot dogs and cookouts and swimming and fireworks. The 4th of July is about a country that was founded, rooted, and established on Christian principles. It was Patrick Henry that said it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists but by Christians. Not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to stop right there before I read some other quotes. Right out of the Marxist playbook, when you set out to take down a nation, you want to separate it from its history. And that's why people are tearing down statues today. That's right. And uh, anarchists are running wild in the street. I mean, to the point that in one of our major cities, in, in, in the state of Washington, they've taken over several blocks uh, within the city limits. These things ought not so to be in America. But let me tell you what, the, the, the uh, small percentage of people that are crying the loudest and yelling the loudest today are the wrong kinds of people. When are the people of God going to stand up and insist that we be heard? It's time that we raise our voices. It's time for the sleeping giant in this nation to awaken once again. America needs you folks. And there's a movement afoot today um, the progressives, the far left, the liberals that desire that we forget our history. And I can understand why. Consider what George Washington said in his farewell address to the nation. He said, do not let anyone claim tribute of American patriotism if they even attempt to remove religion from politics. 
I'd like for D.C. to go back and read some of these quotes. President Thomas Jefferson, in an address to Danbury Baptist, said, The First Amendment has created a wall of separation between church and state, but that wall is a one-directional wall. It keeps the government from running the church, but it makes sure that Christian principles will always stay in government. And what you're being told about the separation of church and state, ladies and gentlemen, today is a lie. That's right. right man. Just look to Jefferson. And John Adams said, we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Our Constitution was made for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. So you can see that despite what modernist, uh, modern politicians uh, may say in the contemporary media or the history uh, revisionist, America was founded not on the concept of freedom to worship actually any God, but on, on the freedom uh, to worship Jesus Christ. We have freedom of religion here, but our forefathers intended that we have the freedom to worship Jesus Christ in America. And they were not thinking about Muhammad. They weren't thinking about Allah. I mean, that's the truth of the matter. I wish no harm upon these people. Don't get me wrong. But we need to understand our roots today and not be separated from our history. So today I want to look briefly at, a parallel, at the parallel between our founding fathers, uh, their allegiance to this country, and our allegiance to the Lamb, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. First, we look at the Patriots. When you, look, when you study the lives of the Patriots, you realize one thing. They made a, a very bold declaration. Uh, when they began to separate from Great Britain. For more than 14 months after the Battle of Lexington and Concord, uh, which was April the 19th, 1775, the Patriots fought not for their independence, but rather they fought for their rights within the British Empire. And that's how things started in the Revolutionary War. Rights that had been gradually taken away and hundreds of Americans gave their lives to regain those rights. In fact, 400 alone died at the Battle of Bunker Hill. Now, Bunker Hill was a hill that overlooked the city of Boston. It was during this time of conflict that Patrick Henry, the fiery politician from Virginia, gave his famous speech at the Virginia Provincial uh, Convention. I read the last two paragraphs of what he had to say. They tell us, sir, that we are weak. Unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when shall we be stronger? Will it be next week or the next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed and when a British guard shall be stationed in every house? Shall we gather strength by irres ir irresolution and inaction? Shall we acquire the means of effectual resistance by lying supinely on our backs and hugging the delusive phantom of hope until our enemies shall have bound us hand and foot? Sir, we are not weak if we make a proper use of those means which the God of nature hath placed in our power. Three millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty and in such a country as that which we possess are invincible by any force which our enemy can send against us. Besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations and who will raise up friends to fight our battles for us. 
The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It is to the vigilant, to the active, to the brave. Besides, sir, we have no election. If we were base enough to desire it, it is now too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat, but in submission and slavery, our chains, our chains are forged. Their clanking can be heard on the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable and let it come. I repeat it, sir, let it come. It is in vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war has actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the earth will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen, gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, Almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. And folks, the patriots of this nation went on to pay a tremendous price with a bold declaration. Early in the summer of 1776, at a meeting of the Continental Congress on July the 2nd, to be exact, the colonies voted to announce and declare that they would accept nothing less than absolute freedom from, from England. After the declaration was signed on, on the 4th of July, couriers were sent with copies of that declaration to George Washington, whose troops were already in New York. And on July the 9th, the declaration was read before the militia troops who were out in the fields. Understand, this was a bold declaration. In, the, in it, the Americans were challenging the most powerful empire in all the world at that particular day. And the, Amer and the Americans entered the war without a navy or an army. Their fighting forces consisted only of militia, uh, militia units in the various colonies. On the other side, England had an army that was uh, well-trained and uh, made up of highly disciplined soldiers. But God was on our side. The special number that you just heard was about to praying to that God. And though it seems like America this time may appear to be irredeemable, and beyond hope, with God, there's always hope if God's people will begin to pray. That's right. Amen. Well, not only did they make a bold declaration, but these early patriots paid a very high price for that declaration. And I guess what concerns me, and doesn't concern me just for you, but for myself, I wonder how high a price God's people are willing to pay now. We've had it so good for so long. We've had it too easy for too long. Yeah. And now we must either rise up or die. Even now, satanic chains are being forged. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. After the Americans declared their independence, they had to win it by force. I don't know how much you remember your history about the Revolutionary War, but uh, one thing you have to appreciate is about a third of the population of the United States back then were totally unconcerned, and they didn't side, they didn't, they didn't care uh, it, whether England or the Patriots were in control, they didn't side with either side. They just wanted to be left alone, just to live life like they wanted to live it. You had another third of the American population who were still loyal to England. They were known as loyalists. And so if independence was to be won, it was dependent upon the patriots, which made up a little bit less than one third of the population of this nation. 
7,200 Americans were killed in the battle, uh, were killed in battle during the war. 8,200 were wounded, 10,000 died from disease and exposure, and nearly 3,000 men died at Valley Forge alone near the end of the war up there in Pennsylvania. What about the 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence? Have you ever read their stories? Of the 56 men, five were captured by the British and tortured before they died. Twelve had their homes ransacked and banned and burned. Two lost their sons in the Revolutionary War. Another two sons were captured. Nine of the 56 signers fought and died from wounds uh, received from the hardships of war. Carter Braxton of Virginia, a wealthy, plan, uh, a wealthy planter and trader, saw his ships sunk by the British Navy. He sold his home and properties to pay his debts and died in poverty. At the Battle of Yorktown, the British General Cornwallis had taken, taken over Thomas Nelson's home for his headquarters. And I love this. Nelson quietly ordered George Washington to, to open fire on his own home. The home was destroyed and Nelson died bankrupt. John Hart was driven from his wife's bedside as she was dying. Another signer of the Declaration. Their 13 children fled for their lives. His fields were destroyed. For over a year, he lived in forests and caves, returning home only to find his wife had died and his children vanished. A few weeks later, he himself died from exhaustion. I wonder if God's people are willing, willing to pay that kind of a price to stand for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Our founding fathers made a bold declaration. They paid a high price, but as it is with God's people, if they will be faithful, these patriots down the road reap a great reward. The war began on April the 19th, 1775, officially ended when the Treaty of Paris was signed in 1783. Nearly two years after the great battle at Yorktown where 10,000 troops laid down their arms and General Cornwallis hid in the cave. They won their freedom. They won their independence. And in the process, the U.S. territory doubled in size as Great Britain gave the new nation all of the land uh, to the east of the Mississippi River. And though many signers of the Great Declaration paid a high price, others reaped a great reward. Two of the signers became presidents. Ten of them became U.S. congressmen. Nineteen of them became judges. Sixteen of them became governors and others held uh, high political offices, not to mention the enduring place they hold in our history today. The patriots, they made a pledge. They paid a price, but they reaped a great reward. I think we need to, as God's people, need to emulate that kind of an example and exude that kind of an attitude. I don't know if how clearly you may remember or understood at the time, but do you remember the day when you stood before the body of Christ when you came forward and confessed Jesus? as your Lord and Savior, when you stood before the body proclaiming your de desire to be a Christian and to be united with Christ, you were at that time pledging your allegiance to the great King, our Savior. You were pledging your devotion, your loyalty, your dedication, your commitment, your very life to the Lamb of God, to Jesus Christ, or you should have been. That should have been our understanding. Understand that at that time you were 
proclaiming what Paul had proclaimed in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life in which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Are the people of God in this building today still crucified with Christ? Crucified to self. Crucified to your own desires. Crucified to your own will. You may live in the flesh, but do you live unto the Lord Jesus Christ is the question. Paul did. And that is the declaration that every saint of God should make as they come to be saved. It's kind of interesting when you study the New Testament, and I don't want to press the issue too far, but in the mind of Christ, if you study the writings of the New Testament, salvation and discipleship greatly overlapped. They were almost synonymous terms. Jesus Christ didn't understand uh, that a person might come to him in salvation and then be unwilling to follow him. But I'm going to tell you folks, and I'm not holding back today, we've got boatloads of saints within our churches all across America that are not following Christ lock, stock, and barrel. And that's why when you woke up this morning, you saw a nation in the cesspool of sin. That's right. You can say it's their fault, but it's not. It's our fault. Friends, it is a very bold declaration to say that you will no longer live for yourself. This declaration is as bold and powerful as the one that Joshua gave in Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 and 15. Listen to what he said. He said, Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. I've only got one plaque of scripture Hanging on the walls of my house, to my knowledge, is a big plaque over the picture window. As you look through that picture window outside, every time you look up, you see, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's there because it's good for me to meditate on often. I was looking at it last night once again and thinking about it. And how faithful have I been in that regard. May God help us to be faithful. When you came to Christ, you pledged your allegiance to the Lamb, ladies and gentlemen. How have you been doing with that pledge? And like the, the patriots, you're going to be called upon to pay a higher price if you truly stand for Jesus Christ. It's one thing to make a bold declaration in the, in the comfort of a church building, but it's quite another to, to live up to it to pay the price, to fulfill that declaration on the battlefields of our daily lives. Actions are much tougher, you know. And you know, on that day when Joshua made his bold declaration before the congregation of God's people, he was not alone in that declaration because there were others also who, who said the same words, but they said them in the comfort of the assembly. In Joshua 24, verse 16, and the last part of verse 18, and the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. Therefore, will we also serve the Lord? He is our God. 
They were pledging their allegiance to God. But tragically, it didn't last very long. Judges chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. Saints of God, you're not doing that, are you? You're not worshiping the God of your own will, are you? You're not pursuing the God of pleasure, are you? Is Jesus still first in your life? It's, again, easy to come here and express what we will do for the Lord. But folks, I fully expect the time is soon coming when we'll find out who among us truly is willing to stand for Christ. Because God's people in this nation, I believe, is about to be tested. We've been talking about that for a long time. We've been talking about the day that was coming. I believe the day is just about here. I think we need to understand that wars are not won by those who only make declarations but those, uh, and, and those who just make claims and those who merely speak words. No victory is achieved by those who lift only their voices but those who are willing to sacrifice all. And a final reason our war is hard is because others like that one-third of the colonists are unconcerned about the outcome of the, of the war. And that's the state of affairs with many of the saints of God today. Unconcerned. I thank God for those of you that are here. I, I thank God for those that have some underlying illness or weakness and are planning it safe and staying home from church today, but I believe there are others that could be here that choose to let fear control their lives instead of trusting their God to go forward. You may think I'm being mean, you may think I'm being harsh, but I don't think I think God's people have had it too good for too long and we've grown soft. Where's the commitment that we need among God's people today? Well, that's, that chime means I'm supposed to quit closing prayer. Okay, we've, we've hit the 1130 hour and somebody's trying to drop a not so subtle hint. For me to be quiet and move on. <laughs> well, let's make no mistake about it. I'm almost done here, but there is a high price to fulfill our declaration that Jesus Christ is the Lord of our lives. And our Lord demands total, radical, uns unswerving allegiance. And the fact that he does is no secret. I'm always impressed by certain scriptures in the New Testament. I can't get beyond them. I don't want to get beyond them. In Luke chapter 9, beginning at verse 23, And he, Jesus, said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake and the same shall save it. For what? Is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or, or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. And then in Luke chapter 14, verses 25 and 27, 
And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, Let me tell you what, I'm about to give you a very hard text, and I don't think that many of us, or that all of us as God's people, get this either. The high demand of following Christ. We think we're prepared for it, but are we really? I can see, I mean, Jesus, in the middle part of his ministry, really right up to that final week of his life, was extremely popular. His popularity was growing everywhere that he went, and a great crowd was following him. And, uh, but following him for what reason? Benefits. And so Jesus finally turned around to him. You can picture this in your own mind. And listen to what he said. He said, if any man will come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. What are we going to do with that one? And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. I don't think Jesus is saying you should hate your family, but what he is saying is that your love for him should be so much greater than your love for your family that in comparison looks like hate. Hey, let me just get out of this preaching mode here for a moment. I mean, um, ladies and gentlemen, saints of God, how many of us love God that much? Do we love God as much as the early patriots loved freedom and this nation? In Luke 14, 13, so likewise, whosoever he, he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. There are also some very severe warnings in scripture about those who merely make the declaration and who speak only the words but are not willing to back it up with their actions. And we find those scary words in Matthew 7, to me the most ominous words, for me personally in all the word of God, where Jesus stood there and he said, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he and get this next phrase. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in, the, and in thy name have done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work in iniquity. And this breaks my heart, folks, but I am convinced that throughout my redeemed life, I have gone to church with people that will one day hear those words, the same people who professed Christ, but had no allegiance to it. In Titus chapter 1, verse 16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny and being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. You know, what is it? And I am honestly about done. I'm on my last page of notes if anybody's wondering. <laughs> what is it that gets in the way of people keeping and fulfilling their declarations of the Lord Jesus Christ? I think most uh, I think most people meant it when they gave it. I, no doubt there has been a time in your life, maybe more than once, when you've come to this whole altar down here and uh, just surrendered to the will of God. 
and covenanted with God to follow him, whatever be the cost. But where are you with that commitment now? We've all done that. I've done that. But yet there have been times in my life where I have backslidden and fallen away from that covenant and commitment. What is it that gives us the problem? The problem is simply this, it's self. We get in the way our pride, our opinion, our desires, our comfort, our convenience, our will, our way. It's just us. What do you think Jesus meant by the term pick up your cross? He meant I need for you to die. Die to self. As Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. But nevertheless, I live. To pick up your cross daily, to deny self, or to die to self is a high price to pay, but the reward we shall reap is a great one. Let me read these few verses to you, and I'm done. I love John chapter 8, or first uh, John 8, 32, it says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. John 8, 36, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. And then there's Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans 8, 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And then Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. For all, all those of you that have made a bold declaration and have paid the price Know this, one day it will be worth it all. Amen. Amen. Worth it all. Amen. So go forth in this place with, an, encur with uh, an encouraged heart and a new resolution, if need be, to stand up and to stand up for Jesus in these days of darkness. Where this country goes from here, what happens to America from this day forward, it's not up to those that are protesting in the streets, and it's not up to those who sit behind their desks in the halls of Congress. It's up to God's people, That's right. and God's people alone. You've made the declaration, now will you pay the price and do what needs to be done to save America. Dear Father, we thank you so much for the blessings of this day. We, Lord, we thank you for our rich history. It has been said, Father, by others that history really simply means his story. And I tell you what, Lord, when we look back on the history of America, your hand is so clearly seen. America became great because America was good. As Alexis de Tocqueville once observed, a French philosopher. But America was good because, as he also said, that back in the day, the pulpits were aflame for righteousness. Lord, this nation has been blessed because the nation was planted upon the word of God. And you gave us great leaders that revered thy throne and worship. Lord, I pray that you'd return us to those days 
And as we close today, we pray for ourselves that you would keep us faithful to the commitments that have been made. And that with our bold declaration, it would be backed up by fervent action. And Father, we pray for those who rule over us, that you would turn their hearts to Jesus Christ. Father, to someone here today under the hearing of your word who has lost that commitment, that dedication to the Savior, I pray that with your help they would resolve to repent and turn from their wicked ways and return unto thee today. Lord, have your will and shackle the devil. In these closing moments, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. What's the invitation? I surrender all. You know the words all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. Do, do we have that ready to? Okay. If God's spoken to your heart today, would you use these closing moments to your benefit and just come somewhere to the altar of prayer up here and recommit your life to the to the Lord Jesus Christ, if that's something that you need to do. Let's stand up and sing the first stanza of I Surrender All. second stanza. Thank you so much for this message today. Lord, thank you for America. Pray, to the Lord, that you help us to surrender as Christians, Lord. Help us to surrender all. Help us to bring America back to your knees, Lord, back to our knees for you. Help us as Christians, Lord, to get on our knees and surrender and, and come back to you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord, for everything you've done for us. Thank you, Lord, for the freedom that we have to serve you in our churches today. Lord, I just pray that you'll help us to uh, come to you, Lord, when that, when that time comes and we may not be able to do that. Lord, just help us to, uh, to trust in you and everything that we do. Pray now, Lord, you'll be with us. Be with America today, Lord. Be with us as Christians around the world, Lord, here at, at Calvary Baptist Church. Lord, just help us and guide us and direct us, Lord. Pray that folks will be saved and come back to, uh, to serve you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. 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 God bless you.